you're thankful for that, will you give him praise today? We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to I want us to just stop before we um, jump into announcements, and I want us to take a few moments to pray for our friends in Ukraine. And um, all of us are burdened with what's happening there. Next um, Sunday, as you know, we have some missionaries that are very close to our church that are in Ukraine that are here with us every year, and we always help them, give them money. I always talk about how one dollar goes so far there. Um, they just happened two weeks ago. It was their time to come home, and they left two weeks ago. So they're in the States, and they're going to be with us next week, and they're, we're going to be able to talk to them. Um, they're trying to get food to some of their, you know, they have a halfway house for women and men and children. They're trying to get food there. Um, just a very burdensome situation. He's going to be with us. She's going to be with us next week. Um, we'll interview them, and we're going to give to them. I want to give a generous offering to Ukraine next week. Amen. But let's take a minute to pray. God, we just pray for the people of Ukraine, the wonderful Christians that, that I've met in my time in Ukraine, the wonderful pastors. God, we pray, Lord, they've been turned into soldiers now. God, protect your people, Lord. Protect your church. God, also for the people of Russia, Lord, that are, that are pulled into this, Lord, we pray, God, that there'd be peace. There'd be a spirit of peace upon that country, a spirit of peace upon Ukraine. Let your hand be upon this situation. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. couple announcements today. Again, welcome to River City Church, and it's so exciting to have you here. If you are a senior here today, if you're a senior, on March 9th, we're going to have a senior's brunch at 10 a.m., okay? This is something that I wanted to do um, coming out of the epidemic, that, um, or the pandemic, that I just got our seniors together every once in a while, and I bought you lunch, so there's no charge, okay? There's no charge. You just got to register so we know to order food for you when we get it catered. And my dad, um, Pastor Ron, is going to be speaking at this, so that's March 6th, March 9th. Today, we need you to sign up if you can. Get online. If you need help, Everybody outside pretty much can help you. My wife can help you. Go with your phone. If you can't do it at all, call the office this week and we'll get you signed up, okay? Tonight we have a fun night planned. We have the roller skating at 5.30 to 7.30. Information is on this flyer. Bring your kids out. Um, bring your roller blades out. Bring your white pants out and your silk shirt and just have a good time roller, roller skating. We've got the rink all to ourselves and it's donation only. So um, come have fun, just donation to help us cover the cost. Next Sunday, we have a very busy Sunday. We've got both services in the morning and then we have our annual business meeting at four and a volunteer rally at five with a nacho bar, okay? So they bring um, a side dish nachos. So whatever you like on your nachos, you bring that to share with everybody. It's gonna be a fun time. Um, we've got some important, important things we're gonna talk about at the annual business meeting, but more so at the volunteer rally. So we wanna invite you to be part of all of those things. Children, you are dismissed to kids' church. Yes, they're happy to get out. They don't have to hear me talk anymore, all right? Let's, um, let's pray right now. God, we welcome your presence as we enter into worship. We welcome your presence here today, God. We just want you, and we just want you to show up in the name of Jesus. We're going to spend some time in worship now. We want to invite you, however you need to get into worship. If you want to come to the altar, get on your knees. If you want to sit down, whatever gets you into the presence of the Lord, that's what we want to do today. Feel comfortable raising your hands, closing your eyes. We're going to have a powerful time in the presence of God, and we welcome you to show up how you want, Lord, as we surrender to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.
wonder, come on. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Filled with wonder, sing that again. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. One more time, filled with wonder, filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Call on the name of Jesus. Come on. Jesus, your name is powerful. wonderful Jesus and we do join with all of heaven in worship of you today we put you on the throne of our lives be Lord of our lives God rule our lives we're amazed by you we're amazed by who you are make yourself real to us in new degrees in new ways Lord Jesus thank you Jesus Amen. Come on, let's give him praise this morning. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Worship team, thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Um, before I get into the word today, I want to invite um, Pastor Jamie to come on up. Astora can stay up here too. Um, Pastor Jamie, come on up because Pastor Jamie got a promotion this last couple weeks in our district, and um, it's an exciting thing. And what has happened is um, out of all the youth pastors in our district, which our district is Northern California, it cuts off about Fresno, down through Redding, and Nevada, all of Nevada, um, there's about eight, is that right, about eight 
guys that are regional district youth directors. So they oversee regions of youth groups. And, um, and he stood out among all the youth pastors, all the youth ministries, and he got appointed to regional youth director for this area. And so we are really excited. Um, I love this because I love our staff to be able to serve in greater capacities and have greater influence. And of course, he's still going to be here like he has in the position that he's been in, doing what he's doing, but now he's got greater influence and he's going to be able to do greater things. And we are excited um, and proud of you for being moved into that position. And it says, says something about your heart and about your ministry that we already knew. And now the district's looking at it and saying, we want to recognize that too. And so we're excited about that. Will you stretch your hand towards Pastor Jamie right now? God, we thank you for Pastor Jamie. We thank you for his life. God, we thank you for all the events in his life that have brought him to this moment. To be, to be able to have this sphere of influence and be able to impact our region. God, we thank you, Lord. We pray you give him favor with the youth pastors. Help him to be able to input into their lives and their youth ministries. Help them, him to build them up, to give them courage with his words. God, help them, him to be with them in their, in their darkest moments and have the wisdom to lead them through. God, we pray for revival among our youth. A revival among our youth in Sacramento and Stockton and in all this area, Lord Jesus. In our public schools, let there be a revival. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. 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 Let's give him a big hand one more time. We definitely are proud of you and we're excited about what God is doing in your life and through your ministry. And you can turn with me to Luke chapter 15 today. It is so good to be back at the pulpit. It has been a long time since I've done this. It feels like it's been a long time. And um, out of the eight Sundays we've had so far, I've only preached four of them, which is very unusual um, to do that for me. I'm usually preaching every week. And I tell you, it is so good to be back. Thank you for all your love, support, cards, food, all the things, the prayers while we, our family went through COVID. And we are so happy to be on the other end of that and be able to jump back full force into ministry. So there's only one thing I've accomplished in my preaching this year, which is I had a lot planned, but the Lord's plans are different than ours, amen? There's only one thing I've accomplished, and that was a series on temptation. And I, I really wanted to give you some tools to be able to handle temptation in your life. And so I spent four weeks doing, doing that, just giving you tools. And our goal is that no one here falls into temptation, that you have the strength, that you've got the tools, that when the enemy comes, that you're able to withstand him, that everybody here is, we want 100% success against temptation. Can I hear an amen? But how many of you know <laughs> we're human, aren't we? And at times we fail. At times we buckle under temptation, and we should not be ignorant of that. Because if we are ignorant of that, when it happens, we're so filled with shame that we run from God. We need to know how to handle it when we fail, when we buckle, when we, when we make mistakes, when temptation overcomes us. And so I got done preaching this series, and um, I actually was planning on starting an end time series today, and I'm going to start that next week. Um, and so we'll start a four-week end time series. And, um, but I wanted to stop. I was laying in my bed sick with COVID, and I thought I kind of left them hanging because um, <laughs> I need to talk to them about what to do when they fail. How, how do you pick it up? How does God look at failure? What happens on the other side of our failure? I, I want you to know it breaks my heart, the amount of people I see fail and then not come back to the Lord. And it's because they're just so filled with that sense of like, I can't. I can't go back to God because how they view the other side of failure is wrong. I, I want you to hear me today. How you view the other side of failure is really, really important to your Christian walk. It's a really important thing for you to know how to, how to look at this because it will be detrimental if you don't look at it correctly. When we were on our way, we went in November um, and drove to Texas to visit my son. And on our way in the middle of New Mexico at night, we had a flat tire. And so I found a spot, pulled over. We were in the dirt. It was like New Mexico dirt. It was just dark. It was hot. It was dirty. And I had a flat tire. But luckily, I have a 15-year-old. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? 15-year-old. And I'm like, I got out and I said, Sharon, come with me. I'm not changing this flat tire, 
right? I'm 43 years old. There's no way I'm getting in that dirt. So, so I had him doing it. And I don't, I don't know about you. We, we took the tire off, put it back on. I don't, I don't know about you, but my dad taught me that when you change a flat tire you, and you're tightening it, you go across like this, right? You don't go around in a circle. Do not go around in a circle. Why? I don't know. But do not go around in a circle. Go across like this, right? My dad taught me this. My grandpa taught my dad this. My great-grandpa taught his dad that. My great-great-grandpa rode a horse, so I don't think that he taught him. <laughs> he taught him how to shoe horses at that point. But, um, but so we, that's a family tradition, right? So I, I sit down, I telling him how to do it, and I say, okay, Jaron, um, now you're going to tighten the bullet. You're going to go across like this. And he started going around. No, across. And then he started going every one. He just could not get how to tighten the bolts. So I looked at him and I said, you stupid kid, you idiot, you piece of garbage. I don't want you in my life anymore. And we got in the car and we left him in New Mexico. (laughs) How many of you know? That's shocking for all of you. You're like, what? Because we would never treat our kids that way, would we? We would never do that to our kids. But we think our heavenly father does that to us when we fail. This is how we view him. We think that that's how he operates. If my son thought I was gonna do that to him, I would be offended if he thought that's how his dad was. Yet we look at Father God and we think that's how he treats us when he fails. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. I want you to hear me today. God does not treat you like that when you fail. Listen, I want you to get this into your heart today. Failure is not the end of the road with your heavenly father. Okay, listen, Failure is not the end of the road with your heavenly father. Failure is not final. Listen to me. There is hope on the other side of failure. It's not a place of dismay and a place of emptiness and a place that you'll never return from. But there is hope on the other side of failure. And our our passage today really addresses this. So how does God deal with failure in our lives. I'm excited to talk about this passage today because this is one of the most powerful passages in the New Testament. I believe one of the most powerful things that Jesus does, the most powerful one of his, of his teachings, Luke 15 is all about the other side of failure. So if you look at the beginning of chapter 15, verse one, and I believe two, Jesus has an accusation made against him. It says some, some religious people come to Jesus and say, hey, um, this guy, we can't believe him. He sits with sinners. He talks to sinners. He has, he, has, he has sinners in his midst. How in the world could he allow sinners to be around him? How could he, it even says that he eats with sinners. He has fellowship with sinners. How does he allow this to happen? And in response, Jesus tells three parables or stories. A parable is a, is a story, an earthly story that is always shocking and kind of goes against what we would think would happen to help us to understand a heavenly principle. So he tells us three three parables, three stories to help us understand what it is that God does when we fail. The first story he he tells us is the story of the wandering sheep. He says there's a shepherd and he's got a hundred sheep and he's got them in a pen and, and one sheep, the stupid sheep, wanders away, right? He wanders away from from the, the shepherd and and the shepherd can't find him. So the shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and he goes after the one sheep. And it says, it says how many of you like, would do this, right? How, how would you, wouldn't you understand that God would do this? And the answer is like, no, like nobody would do that, right? If the stupid sheep wandered away, let the stupid sheep go. I'm not gonna leave the other 99 in danger and go after the one. So logically, and if you tell it from an earthly perspective, we say, no, you wouldn't go after the one for the 99, but... But it says here that the shepherd left the 99 who wouldn't and went after the one, found him, and with celebration brought him back. Now, I want you to understand me today. This parable is not about the sheep. It is about a shepherd that unconditionally loves his people, a shepherd that is willing to leave everything to go after you, to pursue you. It's a parable to show you exactly how God deals with us on the other side a failure. Then there's another story. It's a shorter story, and it's about a woman who lose, has 10 pieces of silver and loses one. And so she starts tearing apart her house, frantically looking for the piece of silver. She's tearing everything apart, 
frantically looking for it. Finally, she finds that piece of silver. She picks it up, and she's so happy to find it that she invites all her friends over and throws a party. Listen, it's not a story about a coin or a piece of silver. It's a story about people who are lost and how God goes after them with everything that he has, how he pursues you in the midst of your failure. And when he finds you, he celebrates you. He doesn't browbeat you. He doesn't condemn you, but he celebrates you. I often think um, the story doesn't make a lot of sense. Most parables don't because if you find one piece of silver, it's only worth a few cents at that time. And she invites all her friends over to party because she found the piece of silver. The party probably cost her more than the piece of silver that she found. Listen, God doesn't measure like that. He's just happy you're home. He's just after you. He just cares about you and he desperately pursues you. These first two parables or these first two stories, they really are there to set up this third story, which is a more elaborate story. It's a more detailed story. It's an incredible picture of how God deals with us in the midst of failure. And I want us to look at this. We're going to pull out five things that happen on the other side of failure. But first, we got to set up the story. And he, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. Now, again, this is a parable, right? So it's telling a story with a heavenly perspective. So this isn't just a man and sons, but the man is the father. The man is our heavenly father, and the sons are you and me. Everyone took the person next to you and said, he's talking about you, okay? So this parable is talking about the father and his relationship with you. Verse 12, and the younger of the sons said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. So give me my half of the inheritance. And he divided his property between them. So the father says, yes, I'm gonna give you all of your gifts. I'm gonna give you everything that you need. I'm gonna give you your half of your inheritance. How many of you know that our father God gives us good gifts, doesn't he? He blesses our lives. He gives us favor. He gives us incredible things. And it can't be measured by money, can it? You look at these Christians in Ukraine that are singing in the subways. They have nothing right now, but they have the joy of the Lord in their lives because of the joy that God gives them. So he gives incredible gifts, and so he divides the property between them. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, so all his father took, had, gave him, and took a journey into a far country. So he takes his half, okay, and he walks away from his father, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. I put the word decapolis there. He goes into a far country. As you read the story, you can tell that Jesus is referring to this place called decapolis, I, I've been to the Holy Land and I've been to these, these areas. Decapolis is any place that is outside the rim of the promised land. So in Decapolis, it was Roman and Greek. And so they had a lot of cult worship, a lot of worship of false gods. They even have stories of, of drugs and prostitution and a lot of perversion that happened in these places. Now, now these places, Decapolis, um, they didn't just want to do that stuff outside of the Holy Land. They wanted, outside of the promised land, they wanted to pull in the young Jewish people into their culture. So they would have huge fairs to try to recruit people to move out of the Holy Land into Decapolis. And they would, now Decapolis wasn't a long ways away. It was just across the lake. So when they're throwing these parties, when they're throwing these fairs, all the young people in Jerusalem and in the Holy Land would be like, wow, we wanna go. And parents would have to try to keep their kids from going and partying. It was the pull of Decapolis. It was a pull outside of the promised land. And they were in this this battle between the flesh and the spirit. And the people that Jesus was telling the story to would have understood this history. They would have understood what the far country was. So there's this pull happening with this young man. He sees the party, he sees the drugs, he sees the sex, he sees all of this stuff outside of the promised land and he's pulled to it. And it says he takes all of the things that his father gave him and he takes them and he runs from his father to a far land. And what does he do? He squanders it all. He wastes it all with reckless living. If you read the end of the story, the brother, his older brother makes a complaint about he spent all his money on prostitution and stuff. So he wasted all the money on reckless living. He had that pull and he failed when he was faced with the temptation. I don't know this guy, and I don't know the total story and what was behind the story that Jesus told here, but I imagine there was other times he was tempted and he succeeded against that temptation. But this time he did not. 
This time he was pulled into it. This time there was failure. How many of you know today that all of us fail? The Bible says that not one of you is righteous, not even one. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fail. The Bible says in 1 John that if a man says he is without sin, he deceives himself. Listen, I'm not nervous being around people that admit that they're sinners. I have, I, I have a hard time being around people that don't think they are. Listen, we are all in the place that we could be pulled into the Decapolis. We could be pulled into the flesh. We could be pulled into the things around us. And then the story goes on. And we had, when he had spent everything, everybody say spent everything. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. How do I know he was in Decapolis? Because they wouldn't let pigs into the Holy Land. He was outside of the Holy Land. And now he's, this good Jewish boy is in the pig pen. How many of you know that sin will take you to the pig pen? Sin will take you to places you never thought you would be, verse 16. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I want you to hear me today. Sin is depleting. Sin steals from you. At first, it might look attractive. I hear the party happening on the other side of the lake. It's gonna be fun. I'm gonna go have some reckless living for myself. I've served my father for so long. I can't wait. I'm gonna go. It's gonna be fun. And we take everything and we, we throw away everything the father has given us and we fall into the temptation and we end up with the pigs, depleted. Listen, I want you to hear me today. Sin steals everything. It doesn't just take an inch. <laughs> Oh, it'll take a little bit. No, it takes everything. And the enemy is not happy until he's pulled you in and taken everything from, from your, your life. You know, sometimes we think because God says don't do something that God's just being a bad guy. Like he says, God says, don't steal. And we think, well, maybe it's because he just doesn't want me to have anything. No, no, no. He knows that it will destroy your relationships and it will destroy you. He, he tells you not to do it because he knows that it's depleting. He says, do not commit adultery. Well, yeah, so God doesn't want me to have fun. No, God doesn't want you to destroy your marriage and your family. <laughs> and he knows what will happen. See, God doesn't give you rules just to be a bad guy. He gives you rules to protect you because he knows that sin is destructive. And now we see this guy who goes away from his father and it's, it's, he's found in this place where there's, there's great destruction. So we've got the son. The son has the favor of God. He's got the blessings of God on his life. It's you and I. He, he fails. He falls into temptation. He's lost everything, and he's in the pig pen. And now we see what happens on the other side of his failure. There's five things that happen I want to look at today. For us, there's, we see that the, the young man recognized. Remember, Jesus is telling this story to help us to understand some things. These are the things he's trying to get us to understand. For the, for the young man, he recognizes and he repents. And then there's God's part. He receives him, he restores him, and he rejoices over him. So I want us to look at, the, at these five things for a second, okay? It says this when the story goes on. But when he came to himself, when he came to himself, when he came to his senses, anyone here today, you remember the moment that you were lost and you came to your senses, he thought, wait a second. He came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? The young man woke up. The young man came to his senses. The young man recognized who his father was. He recognized the care of his father. He recognized the love of his father. Friends, hear me today. Hear me, when we are in the midst of failure, we too often cast God in the shadow of earthly men. So we're in the midst of failure and we start thinking, well, God's gonna treat me like my father treated me when I failed. Maybe your father, maybe that story I told made you cringe because <laughs> that was your reality. That's how your father treated you. So you think that's how God's gonna treat me. Or you, you cast God in the midst of your failure in the, in the, the shadow of of a pastor or a minister in your life that treated you like garbage. And you think, well, that's how God treats me. But most likely it's not either of those. Usually it's this. 
You cast God in the shadow of you. And I want you to hear me today. News for you, you are the most judgmental person you know. I, I don't think you heard me today. You sitting here today are the most judgmental person you know. How many of you know all of us think we do things right and everyone else does things wrong? It's human nature. And we often, when we fail, we start to cast God in the shadow of who we think God is based upon who we think we are. And we say, no, there's no way I can recover from this. There's no way God would allow me back into his, to his fold. There's no way he would come after me, this sheep. I've failed so many times. And we cast God in the shadow of how we see him in the shadow of humanity. When really, friends, when you're in the midst of failure, you need to cast God in the shadow of his word. And the word of God tells us that he is filled with unconditional love for you. Romans 8 says that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Nothing, hear me today, can separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor death, nor demons, nor principalities. Nothing, it says in, in Romans 8, nothing that happens here or nothing that happens in the time ahead of you can separate you from the love of God. That's the shadow you need to cast your father in. He's a God of unconditional love. Not only unconditional love, but he's a God of of unwavering commitment to you. Hebrews 13 says he will never leave you and forsake you. Anyone here, you believe the word of God. Do you believe the word of God to be truth? Do you know what the word of God says? Even when you fail, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. (laughs) I was talking to Gil back there today in the sound booth and I I said, um, he said, where have you been the last few weeks, pastor? And I said, oh, I needed a break from church. And we kind of laughed. And I said, I hate it when people tell me that. Oh, I need a break from church. And he said, yeah, does God ever need a break from us? (laughs) He will never, ever forsake you, friends. Even when you think he wants a break from me, he doesn't want a break from you. He has unconditional love towards you and unwavering commitment towards you. Not only that, he has unending grace to you. Ephesians 2 says that that by grace you are saved through faith, not by your works, lest anyone should boast. Listen, you weren't saved because of anything you did anyway. Don't you think, give yourself that much credit? You think that you're so good that you got your salvation? You were a mess at the beginning and you're a mess now. It is by grace you are saved. And he is there standing with unconditional love, with unwavering commitment, and with unending grace to you. And this is another one that's hard for us to understand. Remember, we're supposed to cast God in the shadow of what his word says. He is a a God of unfathomable forgiveness towards you. I, I want you to get the picture when Jesus was on the cross and they were beating him and killing him. And he turned to them and said, Father, what? Forgive them. This is the God that we serve. And when he came to his senses, when he came to himself, when he woke up, he started to realize that my God is not the God I think he is. When I look back, he never acted in the picture that I'm painting him. Now, that's not who my father is. And the story goes on. He recognizes. And then after he recognizes, something happens here. He says, I will arise and go to my father. I want you to take note, up until this point, he was going away from his father. And now he says, no, I'm gonna go to my father. And I will say to him, father, what? I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Treat me as your hired servant. See, it's again how we see God. I'll go back to him. Maybe he'll accept me, but he's not gonna treat me the same. And he, and he says this, and he, and he arose and he came to his father. This is what I want you to see here. The, the young man, he was headed one direction, which was away from his father. And he woke up and what did he do? He turned around and he started heading back to his father. Friends, he was headed away and he turns around and he's headed to, do you know what this is called? It's called Repentance. And it's available to you that the moment you wake up, God doesn't say you've gone too far, just keep going. But he wants you to repent. He wants you to turn around. He wants you to head back in his direction. 
we were headed to Disneyland years ago. We did church. And then um, after church, we had season tickets to Disneyland. It was the worst year of my life. And um, <laughs> it was after church. And we're like going to Disneyland. And I got on the freeway. Um, and I started heading north. And Shauna goes, where are you going? And I'm like, Disneyland. She goes, you're going the wrong direction. So what did I do? I got off the off ramp. I went around. I turned around. And I went south. And I went towards Disneyland. Friends, that is what, <laughs> that is what repentance is. It's simple. It's a change of mind. It's a change of direction. You're headed the wrong way. God wakes you up. You say, wait, my father's always been good. He's loving. He's gracious. He's caring. And you turn around and you go back in the other direction. This is what we do. This is what we should do when we fail. There is a path for you. Now this is where it gets really good. What does God do? What does God do? It says, but while he was still a long way off. He was a long way off and he saw, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran. What did his father do? He ran, he ran. I I always stop at this moment and I I think, how must the young man have felt? He's nervous. He's nervous. He, He just has faced a lot of rejection in Decapolis, hasn't he? When he had money, he had lots of friends. When he didn't have money, everyone ran from him. He couldn't even find a job. He was thrown into the pig slop. He has faced rejection. And now he says, well, I'm gonna try to go back to my father. He's perfect. He's, he's so great. I'm gonna try to go back to him. And he's walking his direction. And his father spots him and starts running towards him. Remember, his father gave him half his money and now it's all gone. What would you think your father was coming after you for? I would think, man, I am in trouble. This guy's gonna beat me. He's gonna punch me. He's gonna kill me. He's got every right to. And I can't imagine the fear in this young man's life when he saw his dad start running towards him. But when his dad got to him, what does his father do? Remember, this is a heavenly picture. It's it's an earthly story to give us a heavenly picture because we think this run would be a run of revenge, taking a pound of flesh out of you. But it's not, because that's not how our father operates. It says he ran to him and he embraced him and he kissed him. This was a young man who now had a spirit of rejection and now he finds a father who receives him. See, when you come to your senses and you turn and you repent, your father is always there and ready to receive you back. Can I hear an amen? Amen. He's there and ready to receive you back. He's not gonna reject you. He's not gonna throw you away, but he's there with open arms saying, come child, come son. You were lost and now you are found. You were dead, but now you are alive. This is who Father God is and he receives the young man. How else does Father God handle it when we come on the other side of rejection, on the other side of failure? And the son said to him, Father, here's the repentance again. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, he said, I'm no longer worthy. I'm not worthy. His father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. I I want you to understand a few things here. He said, put the best robe on my son. What does God do on the other side of our failure? He puts the best robe on his son. What does this mean? Well, a peasant would have worn no robe. A peasant wouldn't have had anything but undergarments on. But he says, my son is not going to live like that. As a matter of fact, get the best robe, and I want you to put it back on my son, because my son is not going to live as a second-class citizen. Take off those old stained clothes and replace it with a robe. Do you know what? When you come to him and when you turn back to him, he takes off your old, tattered, broken robe. He takes off the stains that are all over you and covering you, and he puts on the robe of salvation, and he says, welcome home, my son. Welcome home. I've got a robe for you. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to restore you to what you were. He puts the robe back on his son. And then it says this, it goes further, and he put it on him, and he put a ring on his hand. That ring had the family signet in it, and if you did business, uh, the sons had this, and they would stamp the family's emblem onto that paper, and he puts it back on the son. Do you know what he's telling the son? 
He's saying, I- I'm going to give you the ability to do business on behalf of the family. How many times have I heard, I'm disqualified now, you don't know what I did? God doesn't treat you that way. He says, I'm bringing you back. I'm putting on the robe of salvation. And friends, I'm going to use you like you could have never have imagined. I'm going to use you. I'm going to use your pain. I'm going to use your brokenness. You're not going to stay there. I'm lifting you out. And I'm going to use your life. And I love this next part because it says that he put, he put shoes on his feet. He didn't say, welcome back, here's a robe, you, you're, you're back in the family, you can do family business, but no shoes for you. No shoes, right? You're gonna remember, <laughs> the robe will cover your feet, but I want you to have sores on your feet. I want you to remember what you did. You're gonna serve this family, but you're gonna do it with a handicap from now on. You're gonna do it remembering what you did. You're gonna do it with just a little bit of pain. I'm gonna make sure that you're moving forward, but you remember your past. He doesn't say that to his son. He puts shoes on him. He says, you're gonna live life abundantly from this point on. You're gonna live life to its fullness. Your your marriage is gonna be completely restored, friends. Your finances will be completely restored. Your life will be a life of abundance. You will live in freedom. I'm not gonna make you live in the shadow of your past. He says, I got a new day for you and I'm gonna put new shoes on you. He restores the young man completely. And then lastly, in worship team, you can come up. And he brings the fatted calf and kills it. And he says, let us celebrate for this is my son who is dead and is alive again. And he is lost and he is found. And they begin to celebrate. Everyone say they celebrated. They celebrated. They celebrated. The fatted calf. It was a, I was reading about the fatted calf this morning just to get a little more information. I read something I hadn't read before that it was a stable fed calf. So it was every single thing that this calf, they always put one calf aside in a wealthy family and everything it ate, they made sure was very specific because they wanted it to be the best tasting meat possible. And they were gonna feed it exactly what they wanted to feed it for years and years and years until it was just at the right point where there was a wedding or there was a party. And then they would kill that calf and they would feed it. Sometimes it was so good, they wouldn't even cook the meat. Ugh. It was like cow sushi. But it was such good meat, such prime meat. And the father says, listen, we've been saving this calf and this is the moment because my son was lost and now he's found. He was dead and he's alive. And all of the family celebrated. Friends, again, a heavenly picture. All of heaven celebrates when you turn. All of heaven welcomes you back. All of heaven restores you. Friends, this is what I want you to see today because we've been talking about temptation. I want you to see that when you fail, that your father is waiting there with open arms for you. He's waiting with open arms. His love, his compassion, his grace, his forgiveness is all available to you. This is the God you serve. (laughs) He is not a God of vengeance. He is a God of grace and love towards you. Will you stand with me all over this place? I I want everyone, if you would, close your eyes today. Just close your eyes. And if you would say, just in your your heart, say, I feel like the prodigal son today. Today, there's areas in my life I turn back right now. I want to invite you just to lift your hands in front of you right now. Just you and God. Just you and God. No one looking. I'm that son. I turn to you today. I turn to you. There's areas of my life. Restore those areas. Restore the brokenness of those areas. I turn back to you. I repent. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Lord. Come on, we're gonna do one more song. I just want you to draw into the presence of the Lord today. Let him pour his love. For I spoke Let him pour his love upon you today. You I want you to feel that presence me. of your Father God accepting you and loving you.